Jesus Christ. We thank you for being our Lord, our Savior, our Shepherd, our King, our Christ. You are immortal. There's none like you. You're invincible. You got all power. There's nothing you can't handle. There's no problem too big for you. There's no issue too large for you. You are God and God all by yourself. And we thank you for your sovereignty. We thank you for your majesty. We thank you for your holiness. We thank you for a brand new day. We thank you for a brand new month. We thank you for a brand new year. We thank you, God, that 2020 was an amazing year. It was a year of challenge. It was a year of so much calamity. But you crossed us over. And now we got a bright, a bright future. And now we got, God, a, a hope and an expectation that this year will be better than the last year. That our, that our present days and our future days will be better than our former days. God, in the rain. Send God the dew drops from heaven and let it fall fresh on us even right now. We need you to bless us. We need you to hold us. We need you to keep us. Draw us nearer God. We just want to be close to you. We just want to be drawn into your presence. We know that in your presence is the fullness of joy and in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So we thank you now God and we came this way to lift up your name. We came this way to say glory We thank you for what we have. We thank you for who you are. We thank you.
Christ. Brand new year, brand new day. And we just thank him for all that he's up to in our lives. We thank him for speaking to our hearts and for manifesting his grace and his power in our lives day in and day out. And I just want to appreciate him for being able to behold so many of you that I haven't seen in a while. God bless each and every one of you for your presence here today. Thank you for your obedience and for just your faithfulness. Amen. As we endeavor to persevere during this time of pandemic, we yet trust God. We yet believe that God is going to bless us and help us in this day and in this time. So we thank him for all that he's up to. Hallelujah today. Well, brothers and sisters, there's a word from the Lord that I want to share in your hearing today. And it is found in the Hebrew hymn book of praise, that is the book of Psalm, the book of Psalm, Psalm number 24. I'm going to call your prayer for attention to Psalm number 24. And I'm reading today from the New King James Version of God's Word. And uh, God wants to speak to us today from this Word. And I want to read Psalm 24 in its entirety. It's just 10 verses. I thank you so much for standing in obedience to God. We know that when the Bible is open, God is speaking, and he wants to speak to us today from his word in Psalm 24. This is a psalm of David, and uh, this is what it says very simply, very familiar. It says, the earth is the Lord's, and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Verse 3, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. Verse 5, he shall receive blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob. Somebody say Jacob. Jacob. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, yeah. who seek your face. Verse 7, lift up your heads, O ye gates, yeah. and be ye lifted up, you yeah. everlasting doors, yeah. and the king of glory shall come in. Yeah. Who is this king of glory? Yeah. The Lord strong and mighty, yeah. the Lord mighty in the battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Verse 10 is where we conclude. It says, who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Amen. For the reading of God's word, you may be seated in the presence of our awesome and amazing God. We know that the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Amen. We bless God today. For the time that is ours in this moment of preaching, I want to share a word and tag it with the help of the Holy Spirit and with your proper consideration. Our God is sovereign. Our God is sovereign. God's sovereignty concerns his absolute rule and control over all of his creation including the affairs of men. He sits on the throne of the universe as Lord, and everything that happens comes about because he either directly causes it or consciously allows it. Nothing enters into history or could ever exist outside of history that does not come under the complete control of God. Only when you understand that this is the kind of God with whom we have to surrender to, will you take seriously the issue of his authority? Right. The painstaking reality is many persons do not like the doctrine of God's sovereignty, primarily because they believe in their estimation that a sovereign God is too demanding and too controlling. Right. We say things like, I'm my own man. Okay. I'm my own woman. I'm in charge. I got this thing figured out and I don't need 
some sovereign God trying to rule over my life. And people of God, it is that very same type of individual that will profess to have their lives together and don't need any assistance from a sovereign God. But as soon as the bottom falls out, and as soon as the pink slip comes, or as soon as the bills can't be paid, and as soon as the devil gets on their trail, that same arrogant, high-minded, I got it going on person will be crying out, Lord, please have mercy on me right now. I'm in a tight place. Come and see about me, Lord. I can't see my way, God. Come take care of this burden. These are the type of people, brothers and sisters, that I want to call a jack-in-the-box. They want a jack-in-the-box God rather, rather than a sovereign God. They want a God who will pop up whenever they call him. A God they can manipulate and a God that they can just maneuver. This God uh, helps the, the, the type of person that has a mindset that they can call on him and he'll just do whatever they want him to do. And I wonder today, can any of you who are truly familiar with the sovereign God imagine who would God go to for permission? Right. Who is higher than the highest? Who is mightier than the mighty? At whose throne would God kneel? Where is the great one to whom he must appeal? The sovereign God moves undisturbed and unhindered toward the fulfillment of those external purposes which he purposed in Christ Jesus before the world began. Toward all this, God is moving with infinite wisdom and perfect precision of action. The sovereignty of God, brothers and sisters, means that he exercises his prerogative to do whatever he pleases with his creation. People of God, please hear me when I tell you that to say that God is sovereign is to say that there is no such thing as luck. Do you believe that today? That there is, there is in fact no such thing as luck. As people of God and people of faith, we should never really use the term luck. Under God, there is no chance happenings. Right. Anything that happens to you, good or bad, must pass through God's fingers first. Right. There are no accidents with God. Right. And brothers and sisters, in our text this morning, penned by David, the Holy Spirit advised me to share with you three movements that this text begs to offer concerning the sovereignty of our great God. Verses 1 and 2 shows us the sovereignty of God from the perspective of creation. Okay. And I want you to see it. We can see the creative hand of God in verses 1 and 2 primarily because the text says the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world, and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Okay. I want to show you, brothers and sisters, that from the perspective of creation, David firstly helps us to know that the earth is the Lord speaks of God's possession. That God possesses everything. That he holds everything in his hands. That he is in control. That he is running and superintending everything that happens in our lives. And he is in control. That God, brothers and sisters, is the owner, creator, and founder of planet Earth. He says the Earth is the Lord's. He is the possessor of all creation. And all its fullness, secondly, speaks of God's prosperity. It speaks of his prosperity. And, and according, brothers and sisters, to world's population that has reached 7.5 billion people, God has prospered and littered creation with fullness to the degree of 7.5 billion people. That speaks of God's prosperous hand. The B clause of verse 1 says, the world, y'all, and those that dwell therein. This speaks of God's people. David is simply giving God consistent praise for his sovereign hand over all he has created. God's rule extends to all people, even those who do not acknowledge 
his power. And so we know from scripture in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse number 14 as it says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and heal their land. And certainly in this time of pandemic, certainly in this time of COVID-19, we need healing. We need the healing hand of God to move. Now, many of us are familiar and we are aware that there's a brand new strand going around right now. It's already touched Colorado. It's already touched California. I just read yesterday that it touched Florida. It's moving and, and running all throughout the world. But we trust that God has everything under control. We trust that God's providence and God's superintendent will handle the affairs of mankind. And we don't worry. We worship. We don't stress. We praise. And we believe that God is about to shift some things. God is about to maneuver some things and work things out because we know that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord who are called according to his purpose. God's got it all worked out, y'all. All we got to do is stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Verse 2 says, for he has found it upon the seas. This speaks, y'all, of God's platform. That God literally has the seas as his standing position. And he's founded it upon the seas. That's the platform in which God stands. This brings to mind a foundation. God uses the sea as the foundation or platform to do all of his creating. Finally, in the B clause of verse number 2, the text says, And established it upon the waters. This speaks of God's power. I told y'all earlier that God is omnipotent, meaning he has all power, that there's nothing he can't handle, that there's nothing that he can't outdo because he is in control, but he's also all powerful, which means he can manage any circumstance that comes into our lives. Now, this directly points back to the creation account in Genesis at chapter number one. God spoke, and whatever he said, it became that because he said it. Yeah. All right. And that's a clear demonstration of his matchless and unlimited power. It'd be one thing if you and I said, let there be light. <laughs> but since God said it, it had to be light because he said it, because he saw it, because he's in control, because he's handling all that exists in lives. The earth is the Lord's that speaks of possession in all its fullness. That's prosperity. The world and those who dwell therein, that's his people. For he has found it upon the seas, that's the platform, and established it upon the floods, that's his power. Now we're able to see the from a clear perspective of creation in verses 1 and 2 as it relates to the sovereignty of God. But in the second place, brothers and sisters, the text continues and picks up at verse number three. And we'll move down to verse number six as it discloses to us the sovereignty of God from the perspective of motivation. Yeah, all right. May I raise a few questions for the sake of contemplation and reflection? I, I just want to get the wheels turning in your mind as you ponder these questions. And the question is, what is it that motivates you to worship our God? Right. What is it quite possibly that motivates you to get your praise on every Sunday? What is it that moves you to spend time with the Lord in prayer and in consecration? What is it that drives you out of that bed that's so comfortable and comfy to get into a place of consecration in a, in a place of disciplined time spent in devotion, spending time in prayer, spending time meditating on the scriptures. Do you worship for cards? Do you worship for cash? Do you worship quite possibly for creature comforts, cribs or clothes? Do you come to church to catch a boot thing? Or are you here to see how well the choir sings? What is it that motivates you to worship and come to church on a consistent basis? Uh, well, let me come this way. What gives you the urge and the compulsion to offer God what he deserves? What is it that inspires you and gives you motivation to keep pressing? 
pressing to keep praying, to keep pushing, and to keep praising your way through the tough, tight, turbulent times of life. I guess what I'm asking is, have you learned to worship through your worry? Have you learned to praise through your pain? Have you learned to bless him although your heart might be bleeding? What is it that motivates you to dress Psalmist name. 
ordained David. Psalm, the book of Psalm, many of you know and I share with you, consists of 150 numbers. David is attributed to having written 73 of the 150. So he wrote almost half of this entire Hebrew hymn book of praise. David in Psalm 24, he blesses us at verse 5 because it helps us to know that this type of worshiper, this type of God chaser, this type of praiser shall receive blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Is that not good news to somebody in this house besides me? That whatever we desire of God, it's available as long as we keep our hands clean and it's available as long as we keep our hearts pure. God says there's a big, huge, wonderful blessing with our names on it and we can receive it, but we've got we've to gotta maintain our eyes on him. But uniquely and awesomely, he closes at verse number six and says, this is Jacob. Wait a minute there. Who? Jacob. He says, verse 6, this is Jacob. Why in God's green earth would David say this is Jacob? When we know from a biblical perspective, according to the book of Genesis, where Jacob is, he is the grandson of Abraham, the son of Isaac, the twin brother of Esau. And we know him. His name means one who grabs at the heel. As he came out of his mother's womb, Rebecca, grabbing at the heel of his twin brother Esau. And for the rest of his life, until he received his conversion in Genesis 32, he would be grabbing, snatching, and trying to take things that didn't belong to him or did they? Bible says that when these twin brothers came out, Esau first, Jacob second, the Bible says that there was a story that uh, Rebecca had a dream, that she dreamed that there was a war going on in her womb because there was this disturbance going on during her pregnancy because she was having these two twin boys and, and she went to God in prayer. She said, God, what is going on in my stomach right now? And God to her in a dream and he told her there's a war going on between two nations. Esau represents the Edomites and Jacob represents the Israelites and there will be a war between these two nations. It was a prophetic wonderful dream that was disclosed to Rebecca from God and from that story Jacob who is the younger God told Rebecca he would be first and the older would be second. Typically the first is first and the second